Hey, welcome. I'm going to talk about the Gustav Pottery Anagama. We call it the Takogama. I'm Professor Stephen Robinson, and I'd like to talk to you about kilns in general first. Of course, you learn how to build kilns um, from a variety of different directions. I started in graduate school, learned a little bit as an undergrad. Uh, Chuck Hines was an amazing professor, as was Bunny McBride. Learned more about catenary and um, Anagamas uh, from Chuck Hines and learned more about sprung arches from Bunny McBride. Actually built a propane kiln in his home studio with him, built with a bunch of students and pearl Anagamas at the University of Iowa. A lot of these images you're seeing, these are kilns that I actually built with uh, students and with my partner, Kathleen Gus. Um, so as you get into it, you figure out what kind of kiln you want. The one I'm going to talk about today is a wood fired kiln stemming out of the traditions in Japan, but really originating in China. And the snake kiln, or the dragon kiln, is a good example of that in China. I was amazingly lucky to visit many snake kilns, dragon kilns, throughout China. Having visited several times, I've seen them in Jingdezhen area, and around Nanjing, outside of Nanjing, down by Dingsan and Yixing, and uh, a lot of other kilns like around Xi'an. This is one from the Terracotta Warriors. Although it's primarily coal fired, a lot of the kilns switched over to coal. Um, you see how large this kiln is, and they fire these kind of tourist wear stuff, but. A lot of snake kilns, a lot of dragon kilns are still running really nice pottery and sculpture through them all over China. This is one outside of Yixing here. I visited several years and actually got to watch them fire and help a bit. This is Xu Xu Tong's compound and shows saggers. The saggers and the pots would be stacked on these bricks because it's a big slope. There's a side stoke you can see there. And you can see where there's a loading area here. There's another loading area up the hill, too. You can see the individual side stokes as this kiln goes up. Um, the saggers are something, again, that's something to protect the wear from any wood ash. Um, a little younger then, but you see them loading pots, and you see them loading saggers. This is Xu Xu Tong's area, um, his compound. There's a little sculpture he made of a kiln and a kiln compound. Amazing artist. Um, this is his kiln kind of museum. Um, not sure how functional it is. You can uh, see from this interior shot that it doesn't seem like there's anything that's ever happened in that kiln. Here's one at a national museum that was just beautiful. So the first kiln I got to build by myself was a hogagama, we called it, because it was kind of a groundhog. There's an article on Ceramics Technical Issue eight or nine in 1999 and I went over um, side top and front elevation of the whole kiln and the building process is is in a I think it's a six page article um, it was a 200 cubic foot onagama it's so really great to build it with students and my partner Kathleen Gus this is a whiskey jug and some tea bowls I made this shows the inside of that kiln Still there, firing just like a rocket ship. This kiln is um, probably my favorite because it was my first um, that I got to do all by myself. You see the reduction at the end and quite a bit of flame licking out the chimney there. So this kiln is the first I got to build for me. We call it Takogama. I'm planning out the floor here looking at the shelf configuration I would want and the rise at the highest part of the arch would be in the first loading chamber. So I'm starting to look at how to set it up and kind of what I want out of this. After firing many kilns, I got a sense of, I wanted a smaller one. I'm laying out the floor here so I have a larger firebox I can use. You're starting to see the size of it. It's a smaller kiln and it's great because we can load it in a you know less than a day, 
So this is showing it's a catenary and most of it's catenary. There's a little bit of springing. You make the forms and then you can use wooden lath you can buy from a hardware store and you put it on the forms. That holds up the bricks as you're starting to lay them. I start with the face and the loading and then I work my way back and forth until it starts to herringbone out into the arch. Here I am just getting the, the last part of the arch done and I'm starting, I had cast that part and I'm putting fiber fracks, uh, kale wool on top of it. Again, wearing safety, making sure you're using uh, gloves and uh, something to protect your lungs. Um, once I had all the fiber fracks on, I started burning it out and uh, burning that form out, you have options of course to drop a form or burn a form out. And in this particular case, it's much easier to just burn out that form. Make sure you cut holes through your um, catenary um, forms so there's airflow. It's all burnt out here. I got, um, I did weld steel on it for buttressing uh, in areas that I was just wanting some structure to it. And then I stucco it with a mixture of Portland cement, some local clay, some fiber, and, uh, and I used some chicken wire to hold it on. So this is showing the interior after it's all burnt out. And then starting to talk about the load, um, collecting the work that you need and looking at different sizes and uh, way too many T-bowls in this First firing put, um, I don't remember how many T-bowls in it, but. So, staging that and looking at that, uh, I'll cover that a little bit more. Okay, remember, make sure you have all your shelves all washed and cleaned before the load. So, you should, the shelves should be more like that. And I'll show you what they shouldn't be. When you're done firing, you should always clean up within the week. So, make sure you have all those shelves all ready for the next people who fire. So this is gonna just cover the ideas around this kiln, but every kiln has similar um, procedures as far as stilting the shelves, as far as the preparation that I discussed earlier. So you see I have a cart that's ready as a staging area. You can have a table set up, but you do wanna make sure everything is pretty cleaned up and ready for you to load before you start loading idea around a half brick or whatever size you're going, put it near the pieces. The problem with that is if they're not wadded, once you put wadding on this piece, it might be too tall. It might be above there. And then when you put the shelf down on it, it could crush the piece a little. So you want to be careful of that. So if you want to check out like kind of how I'm doing it, I have these three carts and a couple carts in the studio, all loaded up, all glazed, all ready to go. Um, have a student piece here, have some uh, community potters here, um, this nice platter of Paul Mabies. And, and so once you're all ready and you're prepared, then you have that work sitting there. And again, you either pre-water or don't. I would suggest pre-watering a certain amount. Some work in here already. So it'll be uh, usually more than just one person doing this. You'd have a team of people doing this. Um, we handing you work and we'll be doing that a little bit later. I'll show you. Okay, it's a little cramped in here. And so this is only a, sh a little more than a shelf width in the back. And it's mm, maybe about three shelves up or two shelves up, depending on how you configure it. And so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna roll out some wadding for the furniture, um, I've already washed the floor area there. Um, and I'll dip the wads in aluminum hydrate right here. And then aluminum hydrate will help it come right off the shelf and right off the furniture. So I'll do that, start putting some work in and you'll see the next step from here. Okay, so you can see how um, the pieces are wadded. You can see how the shelving is all wadded. A little aluminum hydrate kind of powdered sugar on your donuts kind of thing. And I'm ready for one more shelf here and probably one, one more shelf here and then I'll put taller stuff on top. So I'm thinking about 
constricting the flow a little bit on the bottom and having a little up and on top, but I don't want it to just flow across the top. So I want to kind of balance out the load too. That's a couple things I'm looking at because it's going to hit this back wall and want to go down. I've left a little gap there so it can flow once it comes down. And uh, so this space will have some more shelves in it here right before this side stoke here. So I'll get a little more progress done and I'll show you the next step. Okay, I'll be composing this in the kiln. I have the wads for the base of it all set up and these pieces are all part of the composition but they have yet to be adhered to the main form. Uh, and the main form has already been fired and you see a lot of buildup of uh, sodium and wood ash and like this piece too. Um, but what I'm going to do is compose it through some glazing and the glaze will be added to some of these pieces that are right now temporary and after the firing they'll be fixed on it. Now it's in place. The breathing has been glazed and uh, We'll see what the fire does to it. Sometimes I have uh, pieces of soft brick that might hold up a piece. And so I'll cut those off of some scrap, old, you know, old crappy piece of soft brick. Um, normally I'd throw them away, but I would look at like how I can cut that. Um, one of these cheap uh, camp saws works really nice. Obviously they dull at a certain point, but you can just take those um, blades and hit them on an angle grinder. Again, using all your safety precautions with eyes. Uh, it's a way to think about like lifting a piece off of the off of the kiln shelf too. Uh, if you want to get it up in the atmosphere a little more and less less right tight to the kiln shelf, just wads give some flow under a piece. But sometimes like a couple of these little soft bricks, um, they can really help lift it up there and get a lot of flow under a piece. So it's it's something to think about in terms of how you use the fire to paint something on the surface. All right, we're going to discuss uh, making cold packs. Um, we have, uh, the first thing to think about is the type of clay you use. And you could use a really higher refractory clay. In this case, I'm using um, fire clay, some alumina hydrate, 50-50 uh, almost, some uh, sawdust, and I use sawdust or I use vermiculite, and you can wedge that in and it helps you from having any problems with that moisture escaping that comb pack. Preferably, although people forget all the time, um, you should make your comb packs a couple days in advance so they really dry when they go in the kiln. Uh, but if you forget, sometimes vermiculite or sawdust, that helps it wick out during the uh, smoking or the candling of the kiln, okay? So, something to think about. On a lot of compacts, you'll see a little boat area here, an open form, and I'll show you that. That's to catch that lower cone. Uh, the cones that you choose, if you have your body reduction cone or a lower fire cone, um, you're going to want to have a boat to catch it so it's not dripping onto the pots next to it or dripping onto the shelf and having to grind that off. So things to think about with that, all right? So a boat is really nice to have to catch it. Um, so I just like go ahead and push my thumb in there and make this little boat. The other thing, again, to think about what cones you use. In this kiln, I, you know, I don't care about the mid-range temperature in this kiln, so I'm not gonna waste a five or six or even a seven. Uh, any of those cones, I can see visually where we're going and I can use a pyrometer to see climb. But some people choose to use a mid-range cone and then you better use a bow because those will turn into glaze at that cone 10 or 11 or whatever your target cone is. Orton cones used to say it takes three. So you have a guide cone, which is gonna go down. You have your um, target cone, which is the temperature you're wanting to go to. And then you have your guard cone. Your guard cone is the cone you may have tip a little or you try not to let it go down. Okay, so so in a wood kiln, sometimes you, you just go, oh crap, they're all, they all flatten out. And that can happen in a matter of like five minutes. You turn your head and all of a sudden, bam, all your cones are down. That's kind of a drag. 
So you really want to pay attention as you're getting to your uh, guide cone. So your guide cone is, uh, you know, like Davy Crockett's hat. I think the picture shows that, you know, you're, you're guiding, guiding uh, that, that temperature. As soon as your guide cone starts going on, you better be paying attention to your stokes and your temperature climb. Because um, we want to soak in a wood kiln quite often. We want to soak for five to ten hours to a couple days sometimes. We'll like uh, cycle down, cycle back up. Um, so if you feel like you're going to cycle down, then you, as soon as your guide cone starts showing any signs of movement, you might want to say, oh, okay, I'm at cone nine or close to that. I'm going to hold it there. I'm going to cycle down. Try not to climb too much. So there's different uh, mentalities there, of course, in the art of firing. you got to figure out what you want to do. Okay, so choosing your cones. That's one of the things to bring up here, all right? So I like to make separate little... Uh, packs for not even packs just one cone so I can see that particular cone and I know it's that cone and I do that for my body um, so I like Shino's at 010 body reduction now in a wood kiln quite often you're cycling between reduction and oxidation so it may be a moot point for some people but I like to know when that is and I, I give it a little little hard reduction at when 010's going down because that's when my Shino's start fluxing out I don't want a heavy 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 because I could still carb maybe carbon core then and carbon coring is one of those things so you don't ever want to think about too much fuel going in in the beginning of your firing uh, you can you can over stoke a kiln after your body cones go down uh, and generally be okay but you want to think about these issues okay so I'm gonna have these as separate ones I'm only gonna put one in the front on top one in the front on on the uh, the bottom I'm gonna see where which one goes first and then I'm gonna start putting some back pressure on the kiln and allowing that to go into a body everywhere in the back behind the side stoke I may put a uh, a body cone too but visually again I can see what's happening um, so I want to look at that also all right okay so here's what I do again I have some clay just flopped out here I want to think about I'm just going to go 9, 10, 11 on these packs. I'm going to keep it really simple. What's in there? Uh, 9, 10, 11. Sometimes I have a cone um, 18 and a cone 21. Those are fun to bring to people's firing. I'm kidding. I, I would never do that to, to a friend. Uh, so that's a simple of it. You just push it in there. Some people will carve away the excess clay. You don't want to cut too much away because you want some integrity. You don't want your cones falling falling down that you could you could cut away some clay you don't want to have a big fat junky pack you want to use a limited amount and then the last thing really to talk about is you know even with the vermiculite or the sawdust you can poke holes in it you can get all goofy and arty with it too this kiln is a takogama and you'll see my pyrometer says taco west on it Anyway, I only fired on Tuesdays, so uh, it's a taco gama because it, well, it's an atagama, and it's like an upside down taco. But I'm just being silly. Anyway, so you can get all arty with your cone packs, and you can uh, make little sculptures on them. Some people actually um, believe in kiln gods, and I, I don't mean to make light of that, but whatever, whatever floats your boat, you know. Um, so you can make little kiln gods on your cone pack. I'm gonna make a little taco on the end of this one. Gotta make the shell first. And then I'm gonna make some little pieces of meat. Drop that in there. Or it's tofu if you're vegan. Okay. And maybe I'll make some little chunks of lettuce. No, I'm just being silly, right? Oh, I gotta shred some cheese. Some good carnita, good carnita in there. Some, ah. So on your compact, you wanna, um, You want to think about the um, variety of things that I've just discussed. So here, here's an example. There's my little taco with its filling. Um, 
So you want to think of a variety of things that I just mentioned. Um, don't mix up your cones. So what, what, what things you can do wrong are putting a wet comb back in and having it blow. So again, not using vermiculite or sawdust or pre-making pre, pre them. Or on the cone, it says nine here. This one says 10. If I put the 10 first and the nine, so if I put the 10 here, um, then I'll have problems. So if you notice on this one, I don't know if you can read that, but this one says 9, 10, 11. And you want to have those numbers uh, facing to the right or to the left, whatever direction. But if you look at it, the angle of the cone is another thing. You don't, you don't have to put them straight up and down. I just put them the way they're made. So they have a, a somewhat of an angle, such an angle that they fall down. I try and just set them. They don't sit straight up. Okay. All right, so those are the issues around compacts. And, you know, if you have any questions when you're making them, you can always contact me uh, for any kind of extra information. You place them in areas where you can't see, but you really want to see it, especially on the side stoke here in the front of the kiln. Um, stacked up, I'm going to get maybe another quarter inch top of there and then fill it with taller pieces there. And then do one more shelf by the stoke hole and then one more shelf up here and then load some stuff on the face. So that's where we're at. Cone packs in the back, two places. Doors all welded up, ready to go, ready to go. A lot of match. So I share this door, it comes out, goes into these hollow squares and it just lifts up out of there. You see where the brown is. So this door I'm gonna share with the catenary because I didn't wanna to have to spend more money on steel. Yeah, we're ready to go, it's all ready. Pyrometer's all connected, got a little fire going. Got my old gloves from grad school. Yeah, that's real. Iowa. Making some pizza. Not too hot for pizza, almost. And yeah, make sure you wear a mask when you're firing hot. Get up to about nine or two thousand this way. Nice, nice. There's Gussie helping me. Gus and Wyatt helped a little. All right, here, here we go. Second night. Nice, quiet. Been going up to 2100, 22 on the pyrometer. Nine is bending already. Um, you can hear how much velocity is going on in the kiln. It's pretty quiet, and it's just the sound of the kiln and some, maybe some whippoorwills. This morning it's about to set in, and here comes the birds. It's less quiet. Rolling along, nines are down everywhere in the front, tens tipping, gonna hold it or try to. And pulling the heat back to the back stoke. Dampered in slightly, good back pressure. Birds are beautiful. During that second day, I had really even front to back. These pyrometers are way off. Tens down virtually everywhere. All right, going into the second night, and it is pretty windy out. Uh, we fired off on Tuesday. Um, yeah, Taco, Taco West first firing, and it will be hard to hold ten from going all the way down tonight. But that's my goal is to keep 
10 from puddling. It's already tipping all the way down and 11 is following. So I've got my guard cone. Um, my target cone is 10. I want to flatten 10 and probably maybe target above there, but sometimes you don't know what the face of the kiln is going to do. So we'll see what the face does. I can hold the firebox all right here. That's all firebox. And right here is about where the first pieces are. And that is just white hot right now. So side stove, the coal bed has been fairly high when I woke up and took over from Kathy. It was really high, so I'm burning that down. Uh, we did lose our cone pack up top here. The one down low, the 11 was flat um, this morning. Uh, it just must have whipped across the bottom. But as you can see, it's 22. Uh, it's the the um, tweaky there. I think the thermal couples are shot on those, but they're they're about 100 degrees behind. And there you have it. Beautiful day. Beautiful, beautiful day. Just a little too windy. But it's okay, a camper's keeping me in this nice little little area. All right, brief uh, history. Uh, this is called an Anagama. It's a high fire, wood fired kiln. This is what I'm firing right now. You saw how I loaded it and some of the firing sequences um, that I put through in this. You uh, understand that I'm putting wood in it. I'm putting it in at certain intervals. Um, and I'm watching the flame. I'm also watching pyrometers. I'm also watching what are called cones. Cones are kind of clay and glaze material. Uh, put together and their pyrometric equivalents to an exact temperature. So those are the ways that you read the kiln. You can look at the sculpture and the pots in the kiln too and you can see a reflection um, from all the ash and the sodium and all the things that are in the kiln that are fluxing out and creating this glaze on the surface. And you can kind of see when it's starting to mature. Um, but you, can look, look, you can also look at um, temperature so if it's really white hot I'm, I wear safety. It's not it's not hot out right now, but I have to wear leather and leather gloves and uh, definitely not an acrylic hat, but a cotton hat. Some people ask me what the badge, what the patch is. It's actually a Boy Scout pottery badge. There's actually a Boy Scout pottery badge. Anyway, I wear the um, I wear the gear along with the glasses because I want to protect my retina. I want to protect my skin and my hair. Even having hair flopping out like nice stupid pigtails, it's not a good idea. But I'm pretty cautious so with students who make sure you tie your hair back and do all these things button fly jeans are not a good idea too. just the, the metal heats up so the safety around it is because it's 2400 degrees in there at some point 23 something and you're you're getting all this radiant heat out of the kiln again for your eyes that's really important it can burn your retina and you get scar tissue in your retina and you don't want that to happen so we take all these safety precautions all right, so um, stoking at intervals, I have to stoke actually right now. No, nope, it's looking good. Still climbing on the pyrometer. Pyrometers are never great. Uh, they're not exact temperature. Like this one's 180 degrees off because the thermal couples degrade and pyrometers get dropped and stuff. And anyway, so the cones are what you really are looking at, okay? But I'm using the pyrometer regardless um, to look at rise and fall. I can also watch the flame in the chimney or up in a passive damper, I can pull that. And these are indicators to tell me like the flame's not being drawn through the kiln anymore. And that's kind of the simplicity of it. It gets kind of, there's an art to it. You have to read the coal bed and you don't want it to go way high and clog up the kiln. And you don't want it to disappear, of course, too, but you want to keep a nice coal bed. And you'll hear it when it's really literally sucking. This will sound sometimes like a jet plane. It'll be like, so um, you know that there's something really efficient going on there. You might actually want to damper down then. So you create some back pressure and don't just let it all out the chimney. We also read flame coming out the chimney. This is the first time I've fired this one. I've never fired a kiln like this where I didn't get flame out the chimney. I can see it at night. I can see the flame, but um, it's just it's just a big chimney for the kiln that the flames probably contained in that chimney. But you can read it a lot of different ways. Um, so I'm still waiting. It's starting to drop a little, so I will stoke in a minute here. But why would you do this is a question. And there's an aesthetic to every process, of course. I think that if you look at firing an electric kiln or a gas kiln, which sometimes gas kilns have a little bit of this serendipity, let's say, or surprise, happy accidents and sad accidents that occur. And in a wood firing, you get that quite a bit. So you start to learn how to load efficiently, but also effectively for mark making abilities and for uh, creating that river of fire. So it's really an efficient firing and it works really well. But the aesthetic that you get from this um, compared to a soda kiln, uh, it's atmospheric firing aesthetics. And 
you can layer and layer different kinds of wood ash, different types of, uh, of wood that you're going to use is going to have a little bit of a different effect too. For instance, pine is green, oak is a yellow, golden, uh, willow can be bright yellow, uh, cottonwood's like this gray kind of weird concrete ash, and cottonwood has, seems to have more sodium in it. I'm not quite sure like exactly what's happening. One time in Tennessee, we had 18 different trees that we used, and we had like gold and silver elements and per, um, like really blue uh, uh, ash in some areas and we're like maybe that tree was sucking cobalt out of the ground uh, so you start looking at like the the wood and choosing wood cherry and apple around here is really good it's hard to stack uh, fir uh, tamarack pine there's a lot of ways to look at releasing BTUs too if you can get hardwood which I was lucky to get some hardwood that can hold a really hot coal bed for a long time whereas pine can uh, release the BTUs really quickly all right so I'm gonna scope now, and you'll see me uh, moving around here. Here's my dog, my neighbor. Hey, Rod. I'm gonna stoke if you want to see inside there. I'm gonna stoke it if you want to see what's happening inside this thing. Uh, it's not great for your retina, but if you don't do it too long. Uh, Uh, it, I flattened all the cones uh, yesterday actually. Kathy was holding it all night. Yeah. And uh, we are. We were, I was all, almost too tired last night and I kind of wanted to just call it quit. But it's nice to. Um, just um, explaining to my students that it's nice to do this layering where you can cycle the firing up and down too. But we're cycling it from like cone 9 to cone 11, cone 9 to cone 11 and just layering tons of ash on there so the pots will have quite a bit more. There's a sculpture up front that's a student of mine and it's just, just covered with, with gooey, gooey ash and it's got all these rivulets, these like little rivers of ash running down. It's really cool. So every time I stoke, it drops temperature uh -huh. and it goes into a reduction cycle. And you see the mouse gray smoke is what you want. Sometimes you get this really rich black smoke that's a little heavy of a stoke, so you want to lighten up on your stokes. But um, that mouse gray is showing that it's kind of a, it's reducing in there, but not so heavily, and it's it's going to do that for a little while, maybe four or five minutes here with that stoke. And then it's going to go into this neutral and oxidizing fire where the heat will just go, when the coals will form, and it'll just get white. I don't know if it was white when you looked in there, but it's like white hot in there. It's like a welder, so you got to uh, wear proper glasses. It's really great during the firing to talk to my neighbor and students and then I checked in with Gallery 1 and had a virtual discussion about wood firing, why you would do it, and people got to see what was going on here through the online experience. Yeah, you can see how white hot it is. I zoom in the infrared, look over it, and there's one of Paul's big pots right there. And then one of mine next to it, and next to it. Yeah, so... So it seems as though it's just me, but my partner Kathleen Gus and I fired this kiln for these three days and uh, our kids helped a little too. It is white hot in here, as you can see. Front and back are done, done, done. We're going to hold it for another 15, 20 hours. Just stoke the front. Good back pressure. Cruising along. Good. Everything's looking good. It's a starry night. You cannot see them, but it is gorgeous. some flame licking dampers a bit in you can hear it mmm yum got some potatoes cooking inside stoke prepping this um, 
kind of post-fire reduction chamber with this smoker grill I have. And I'm going to be putting a piece in there. All right, third day. Um, this T-bowl in the front has been good cone, I don't know, 15. <laughs> it's a local clay from up in Lake Chelan that a student of mine brought me a nice big chunk of. I'm going to pull it out. I've got a couple other ones in there. I'm going to pull it out and uh, do a kind of post-fire reduction. Or at least I'm going to try and pull it out. Um, should have proper safety gear on. So I should probably switch into my Dididium shades here. These are gold-plated uh, shades and they, they block out all the UV. And I should probably put some leather on because it's going to get hot fishing this sucker out. So I'm going to look pretty funky. So here we go. Um, this is always a challenge because there's things in the way. I, sh I have a comb pack that I'll probably knock off, but it's all flat. It's no big deal. Um, here we go. There we go. Woohoo! I think I'll drink something out of it this morning. All right, I'm gonna go back to fire now. All right, I pulled it out and it's all uh, some nice glaze melt in there. And then the outside has some iridescence there. I made this bowl really textural, stretched the clay a lot. So the surface has this kind of tactile quality. So it looks good. It's all ready for a little bit of tea or something else maybe. I stuck the front really heavy and got a lot of back pressure. I like to think of what Chuck Hines taught me about mouse gray smoke compared to black smoke. And uh, so the dampers are out enough. Even the smoke coming out here isn't really sooty black. Um, one of the things you can count is 40 to 50 seconds of mouse gray and then it clears. That's a really good stoke sometimes where you're really efficient. It goes back into a neutral and then oxidizing, uh, depending on what part of the firing you're doing. And my potatoes are still cooking. Just holding and cranking. And I think this is right when the pyrometer thermocouple melted. I also had a nice open Zoom meeting with some students during the fire. I like the foot of the bowl. Uh, I know you brought up uh, the ring method as an option. How short can we make that ring? That's up to you. I'm thinking about balance. Did you see the larger one that I did? Yeah, I did. So it, it's up to you. And I would say with the drawings and your research, yours are a little smaller. You know, you look at what you want to do with that, okay? And, uh, you know, you'll find bowls. There's these ones from the Sung Dynasty that are like big, tall feet on them. And there's some in the Koryo Dynasty in Korea too. They're just, so I wanted to like illuminate some some other ways to think about feet. Yeah, okay, that's really interesting. Uh, in the slump and molding bowls lecture, uh, you said a lot of times, like, make sure your finger's damp, but don't put water on it. And I was wondering why that is. So water brings up um, a problem because it removes a lot of fine particles and you're left with the coarser particles. Mm. Now, it all depends on the clay you're working with. But if you use a nice moist fingertip, you can have a lot less sloppy and a lot less groggy of a lip or a surface. So people think they can sponge their work and clean it up and it always looks really coarse and groggy. Now, if that's what you want aesthetically, you could do that. But I'm just trying to teach you how to really get like nice smooth surfaces when you want them. 
And like I even did some stuff um, where I've added five mesh grog, which is really coarse particles. Uh, just giant. You could see these chunks in the clay. It hurt my hands when I threw it. Um, but I would then sponge the hell out of it to get this surface that was um, really tactile. Um, so there's ways to play with it aesthetically and in the ergonomic side of it. If you're looking at how it feels in the hand and that tactile experience or in the balance of it, like it actually grips um, in that area. And so there's ways to play with surfaces in different manners, right? Yeah. Okay, awesome. That's really cool. I think that's all the questions I had. Savannah, it's always great that you chime in and come here and I'm, uh, I really appreciate your questions. So thank you. Yeah, thank you for answering them and having this office time-ish. You bet. I know it's weird. And I've been firing this kiln. This is the three-day firing, so I'm a little um, delirious. Uh, so you have to put wood in it all day long for three yeah. days. And my wife and I, we usually um, do it uh, as a group where there's like five or six people. But because of COVID, we, have, we can't really social distance fire. We kind of can. It's kind of good to know that we can do it ourselves too, you know? Yeah, no, that's really cool. I hope you have, I hope it turns out okay. Like, good luck. <laughs> it, look, it looks great. I could show you a, a piece I pulled out this morning because I like to pull a T-bowl out or something. Let me grab it. Yeah. Hard to see it on the inside, but um, that's the outside is all iridescent and the inside is all glazed from the wood ash there. Oh, cool. And, and then it's made from a nice clay up around Lake Chelan. Student of mine gave me 50 pounds of it, and it's really tough. I put the texture on it by stretching it, um, and it's got a real nice tactile quality, and it goes to cone 15. I mean, it, it was blasted in the front of this kiln. And I pulled it out, and I stuck it in a barbecue grill with a bunch of sawdust and kind of did this sort of post-fire raku technique with it. But anyway, yeah, it's it's... It's been fun. It's a rocket ship. This is the first time we fired this one. So. And I actually found this video of these people slab building, or what? I think that's what it's called, slab building, but with chocolate. Yeah. Chocolate. It was so cool. I think I have Yeah. Were they building a sailboat? Uh, no, they're building like a vase. Oh, yeah. I have one on my Augusta Pottery Channel where they're building a sailboat out of chocolate. But they're using all these techniques that I'm teaching you all, and it's yeah. really cool. And I, we did an edible art thing when I was at the Archie Bray Foundation in Montana. And we would, uh, I had a friend who actually slip cast chocolate into some molds. Dean, Dean Adams, you can look him up and see his work. It's really amazing work. I would love a class like that. That'd be so much fun. Yeah, I would love to teach something like that at Gallery One or something. Yeah. Well, awesome. I hope you have a great rest of the day. I'll come back if I have any more questions. You bet. You bet. I wish you were here to help me split wood. <laughs> <laughs> me too. Right. Probably be good to get out of the dorm anyways. I'll bet. Well, you hang in there. Let me know if you need anything, okay? I will. See ya. Bye. Bye. Yeah, that's what I'm talking about. Sometimes people don't have a really solid connection. All right, there we go. I can see you now. You're back. Oh, now I see you. Nice flannel. So this is how big I'm putting the, I'm splitting it. I prepped all the wood, but I'm splitting it smaller for this at the end because I'm just trying to really blast it and melt all the crusty musties on there. Let me show you that bowl. I was going to say, is that, is that to kick the temperature up so that it, the fire temperature isn't dropping when you add wood? Yeah, it releases the BTUs like that. But you have to use pine or something like fir, or tamarack, pine. Um, it it allows the BTUs to come out. If you use a hardwood, you can do that too. But you want to stoke a lot less. So this is the. Let me show you that. So you see the glaze on the inside? Yeah. That's all wood ash. This went to cone fourteen fifteen probably. Hundred percent. That clay is a hundred percent Lake Chelan clay. That you gave Sweet. me. Sweet. That's say, beautiful, yeah. man. I'll send you actual pictures of it so you can see the surface. It got all iridescent here. I took it out. I, I'm going to do a little, I'm doing a little video on it so you'll see that. But took it out and I put it in a charcoal grill over here with tons of sawdust. Kind of raccooned it in a way. Um, yeah. Listen. Oh, man, that's a beautiful sound. It's not, it's not dunted at all from that. 
So what, what I like to do every Anagama firing, at least, because you can get in there, is to take everybody firing has to make one or two T-balls, and we'll put them in the front. We take them out right at the end of the firing. And then when the last piece of wood goes in, then you can drink your tea out of it. Mm. Like, you, you drink tea, uh, I might drink something else, you know, but. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And obviously, I don't do that at school, but, you know. But, yeah, um, 18, uh, what was it, last so this is the third day and it was, I can't remember when I hit like cone nine was going down like after 13 hours, 14 hours. So it's just been holding and sticky. You know, what's cool is it's sticky and you hold it at that temperature and all the apps that's going through there just sticks to it instead of flying out the uh, chimney. Instead of moving through. Yep. So how are you? Do you have any anything to talk about it, like with your work or anything? You just want to hang? So I like to get my back soak wood a certain size before I'm even ready to fire, like pre prep it at a certain size. But I also sometimes look at it, want to make it a little smaller. And for this fire I'm making, putting like right at the end here, really blasting it off with maybe five or 10 of these every now and then. This is called a roughneck. They come from England. They're offset a little. They're not sharp at all. So you don't have to worry about your hand, but you still you know get your hand out of the way you see the angle on it there when it hits it it splits it so it's got a lot of weight but it's a nice little kindling small and you can like pop it you can even put it on the on the wood and just bounce the wood like that if you really want to make small stuff and see how that works it's pretty nice small so you got to order them from england and uh, I got some for school and some for home and you know just order order a few give them away as gifts if you know other people who wood fire they're great all right I gotta get back to the side stuff just a glorious day got tons of wood Gretch is happy cranking away So, um, you know, when you're done firing, you always want to clean up. Just like when you're unloading, you want to make sure you clean all the shelves so it's all ready. Um, I'm all cleaned up, clammed up, and uh, kiln is going to cool for about five or six days. And uh, it's just ready for us when we um, are going to unload, so it's not a big mess. It's also could be a fire hazard if you leave too much crap laying around your kiln so you want to make sure there's no scraps of wood or anything because it's pretty hot for a while and so you want to be a little cautious of that so i like to sweep and hose down i don't really want to sweep uh, until it's wet so i i'll hose it down then i'll sweep it kind of squeegee it off the pad and uh or make a big pile and scoop it up big wet pile that way i'm not breathing any of it all right you can see it's all clammed up um every hole i like to take the ash from the kiln itself mix it with some fire clay and uh clam it up so that's it i'm tired so i'm going to clean up myself now and Drink something out of that little tea bowl I pulled out. Cheers. So I've got flour out, we're waiting about four days now. Pulled something out of the back stove. One of Kathy's there and then yanked this cup out through the back stove that fell in the ash. There it is. Little sailboat, O10 body comb. I had some friends over to social distance, some oysters. And had a good time with Mark and Maria. Next day, we're ready. Here we come to unload. So oftentimes, uh, kilns have kind of secret chambers, and this is, I already removed the kiln shelves, but I'll put uh, stuff in the exit flute of this kiln, and I'll put some 
bricks in the holes after I put the work in and then I will put some fiber fracks over it and then inside this big catenary soda I can actually remove some of this during the firing and pull stuff out I'm planning on that later but I'm also looking at you know it's a secret chamber so I'm gonna look at see what's in the secret chamber not Harry Potter but the Potter oh, secret it's a good indicator of temperature that it, it probably didn't get close to maybe bisque firing in here so maybe 1800 degrees it's a unicorn horn that my other son uh, that Gus made and so let's see what that looks like so yeah with solid clay it's a unicorn horn for a project he did at school from that secret chamber that I put it in there green and you can hear the ring so it is um, definitely more than best, but in that chamber, we know also now that we can uh, put some work that gets to a mid range or low fire temperature. So I'll put some cones in there next time. Here's what it looks like in its little archeology span box that he made, including the piece of unicorn poop that he found it was petrified unicorn poop. So four days later, it's Saturday, I um, actually pulled uh, the door a little bit last night and checked it. So I have this, um, this still closed, you know, overnight to keep any air rushing in there and keeping it still cool and slow. I could touch the pieces through the side stove, so I knew it wasn't too bad. But today we're ready to pretty much scrape all of this off. This is all that ash mixed with fire clay and a little sand. It's really sealed the door nicely. So we'll pull all of this brick out here so we can get in here, just like you saw when I was loading. Okay, you see I have removed all of that ash, fire clay, sand kind of coating here. And what you got is options. The uh, way I designed this door was to think about, I could take it all the way down to this first top air hole here. Um, I can't go any farther without a lot of work because this is a full lentil here as it is here. So I can take it down to that hole or I can leave this layer in. It depends on how limber you are uh, and how large of a, a jar you might have. So with this one, when we loaded, there was a really large Subo, a uh, large jar of Paul maybes that we we're putting in the front and it might not have fit. And, you know, so we didn't want to, you know, scrape the jar. So I took it all the way down to that hole. When I do this to unload, you know, it's shrunk and it's strong. And so I may just take it down to there. Uh, of course, um, that'll be how I feel going in and out. So I may take it down a little farther, but this is what we got here. Um, we have to take this apart. And a lot of people will think about like all of these little pieces and keep those in a separate box or even in a uh, upside down cradle that has a curve that you can actually take it apart and just put it right back upside down. And as you put it, the door back in, you just take the first bricks and you know that those are the bricks that you use. So there's different ways to approach this. I just bring up that. Um, what I'm gonna do is also discuss, you know, uh, this is all fired clay now. You can discard of that, that all goes in the garbage. But as you're cleaning up any of this with ash or with the clay, scraping it off the surface, I was wearing a mask. And you wanna make sure that you're, you know, protecting your lungs. And I also wear glasses, so if any chip goes towards my eye. So I'm chipping at it with these kind of vigorously to get that off, all right? So next step, is pull it down and I'll show you that. Okay, there you have it. It took me about an hour and a half really because I set it up here. And if you look, this is the door. And then in this black basket above, there's the little pieces that go into the arch, but it's, this is upside down. And then this is the last courses here that then will be put here. And again, if I choose to take these off, that's what I do. Uh, wearing proper safety. I, I like these gloves, although they're a little warm in the summer and stuff, but they're called Wonder Gloves and they're super durable and they grab the bricks really nice. So I can keep my hands all you know, taken care of a little. And here we see our first peak with the door down really. And that big jar in the middle, that's Paul Mabies. And there's a student piece of mine up on the left and some other student work in there. And so I'm gonna get this ash pit cleaned out. I like a little short shovel for that. And I use a metal container to put in just in case there's any coals that are hot. Uh, you shouldn't be in there with hot coals, but sometimes that happens. 
So uh, make sure you're not putting it in plastic buckets. <sighs> okay, that's uh, quite a bit of ash. It took me a good hour. Uh, but now it's totally clean. It's ready for the next firing, but mainly I'm not treeping in and out of that and, uh, you know, kicking up dust or wood ash while I'm trying to unload because, again, back to safety, it's not good to breathe that. Got some really good ash going on on this piece. Once did slip a little, so it touched a, a teacup it's stuck there, but that looks fixable. All right, and so you get in here and see there's the teacup it touched right there. Maybe that's fixable too. All right, so let's move this. that um, local clay from up by Lake Chelan. Here it is. There's a teacup I made. So let's see how that is. Okay, let's start to look inside where it's not so blasted. It's another weird cup and saucer I made. Uh, start getting inside and seeing what, what the slips look like in here. Another cup and saucer. I fired the saucer upside down on another piece. And look at this on the end of the handle. Eat flower of Gus's. That's pretty nice. These are in the Kathy's jars. Jars. Hey, partner. How you doing? Yeah. <laughs> oh, got them a little too hot. On top, it's an 11 that's flat there. So. But this is the face again, so we're in the face here. It was right up here by one of Paul's bottles. Oh, nice. You like oh, that? Nice. Hey, Paul, <laughs> take your bladder. <laughs> All right, we're getting back past the back stoke. Still got a lot of shelves to get done. All right, I had a comb pack in the back. There's another one farther back, but that's cone 11 down there too. So Still really juicy back here. 11 is actually standing back here. 10 is flat. There's the pyrometer. There's the probe, the thermal couple that melted and fell. It didn't go into the jar, went onto the jar. All right, just looking at the front comb packs now. This was the body, a little motorboat, a little electric trolling motor on there. This was the top pack that was just a little too hot. That's 11 flat. A little tacos. And this, um, was the bottom pack, which was a little less hot, but level was kind of way down there too. And I just pulled it into the coal bed, so it's kind of crusty. Um, and then this is the back, the same thing, where 11's like the front there, and the way back, 11 was still standing up pat right near the damper, about 18 maybe inches from the damper. This is the body cone, 010 melted into this little sailboat, little boat. And this was the other comb pack in the back by the back stoke that had a little coronavirus on it. And it got knocked accidentally into the coal bed. Um, but we still had we still had some visuals. So, so that is the story uh, in cones right there. And here's the story in pots. Just gonna go really quickly over the load as it came out. So this is all the front. You saw Paul's big jar and some silly sculptures and those teacups and saucers of mine. As I roll back all the way to the back, you'll see the last stuff in there. So here's one of Paul's, a bunch of cups of Kathy, some nice trays of Kathy's. Really nice one. Some tea bowls, whiskey bowls of mine. Nice jar of Paul's, some of the kids, really nice cups of the kids pitcher of mine, it's a big dumb beer stein. Yeah, I like it when you just pick it up and it doesn't need anything. There's a lot of, a lot of kind of winners like that. And a big jar I made. There's a sculpture of a student of mine. Another jar I made. Get the lids off eventually. Do some grinding on those. Some plates, a little road runner, a big pasta jar, a nice platter of Paul's plates. It's just like when you lay it out as you unload it in a line, you get to see 
kind of where the real hot spots were or you get to see different things. It seems like this firing was pretty even front to back. Of course, the face had a lot more ash, so right at the main firebox. But uh, it was pretty juicy all the way back to the damper. As you can see, there's a sculpture of mine. Some little pieces of my cousin's kids from years ago that were just in the studio. It's a flower of Gus's. It's a flower of mine. Kathy's new pieces were in there somewhere. More tea bowls, coffee cups. So slowly getting back to the back of it here. And you see. Again, there's not a big, big difference in surface. So we'll be cleaning all this up and uh, documenting it uh, professionally with a nice backdrop and uh, see how these look not out in the sunlight and after they're cleaned. So there'll be some, some wet, dry sandpaper that occurs on some of them to there's any lips or anything that feels like it needs to be softened a little. We'll soften that a little. Here's the last piece. This is that sculpture I was composing in the kiln.
Hey, I know it was long, but I hope you enjoyed it.